This lesson will go through a number of ways that data can be displayed once they have been collected. Starting with time series data. Time series data is collected over a period of time, in this case the years 2001 to 2005. The first graph is a bar chart or a column graph and we have the number of industrial accidents which occurred each year during this time period. The second graph is a line graph with the time periods along the horizontal axis. And in my opinion this is the better form of display because time is the independent variable and we can see the shape of the data with the line graph. A line graph is also useful because we can display more than one line graph on the same pair of axes without it getting too cluttered. Here we have two graphs displaying the same data. The first is a histogram. It's like a column graph and it's used to show frequencies of data which can be grouped or ungrouped. But the difference between a histogram and a bar graph is that there are no gaps between the columns because we're usually dealing with continuous data. The score groups are called classes and the classes for this chart appear to be 60 to 80, 80 to 100. If we look closely you can see that the actual upper and lower boundaries of the class are just before the 80, just before the 60. These values are called the upper class limit and the lower class limit. And so our classes here are 60 to 79, 80 to 99 and so on. But the actual boundaries between the classes are at 79.5, 99.5, etc. Because we could have a score of 79.4 or 79.6, so we're not necessarily dealing with whole numbers. The other form of display here is a frequency polygon. It's exactly the same as a frequency histogram. If you imagine placing a mark in the centre, the top of each bar, and in the gaps just before and just after the bars. Join them up with straight lines and you have a frequency polygon. The main advantage of a polygon over a histogram is that you can display more than one frequency polygon on the same axes more easily than you can with a histogram. Now let's have a go at drawing a histogram for the masses of some potatoes. And if you're Drawing a histogram for your notes, make sure you've got some graph paper and a sharp pencil and a ruler. Don't just scribble a graph if you're making notes on this. So looking at our frequency scale, this is going to be the vertical axis, we need to go up to 24. So I'm going to go up in fives. And then our horizontal scale needs to go up to 300. So I'm going to go up in fifties. This horizontal scale is the mass in grams, and our vertical scale is the frequency. Next I want to work out the upper class limits and the lower class limits, the class boundaries in other words. Between the 99 and the 100, that's going to be 99.5, and we've got 149.5, and so on. And to be consistent, our upper class boundary for the highest class is 299.5 and our lower class boundary for the first class is 49.5. So when we construct our histogram, the boundaries are going to be just to the left of these numbers that we have on our scale here. Now for the bars. The first one has a frequency of 5 and 12. 24 and 4. And of course you won't be able to draw rectangles like I've just done with this computer program. You'll have to draw careful straight lines and join them up with your ruler. Now there's one final thing that we need to add for any graph and that's a title. Now titles in statistics are usually really long, like a whole sentence. And they need to include three important pieces of information the type of graph, what it's measuring, and who 
it's measuring. So our title starts with frequency histogram, the type of graph, and we're showing the mass in grams, and our who is the potatoes in this case. We can even be more specific, we can give the total frequency here. 55 potatoes. The next type of display that I'm going to demonstrate is a scatter plot. Scatter plots are used for bivariate data when we have two variables. In this case, the height and the diameter of some tree trunks. So each dot here represents a tree trunk and we're looking to see if there's a relationship between these two variables. So now let's look at an example of how a scatter graph can help us interpret some results. Some students are doing an experiment, they have a beaker of hot water and they're measuring the temperature every two minutes to see if it falls evenly. Our independent variable is time, so that goes along the horizontal axis, and the temperature is the dependent variable. Now each measurement will be placed as a cross on the grid, firstly 0, 060, then 258, 456, 654, 845, 1051, 1250, 1448 and 1647. What do you think about this data looking at this graph? What do you think about this point here? Do you think it's a mistake? Do you think that the temperature dropped and then rose again? Or do you think perhaps it was recorded incorrectly? Usually when we're drawing a scatter graph, we're looking for a linear relationship between the variables, such that we can draw a line of best fit through most of the points. This point does seem to be an error, because without it, most of the other points are very close to this line of best fit. Finally, we need a title for our graph. Remember, type, what, who. The who doesn't always work, but you should still be looking for three pieces of information. This is a scatter plot showing the temperature of a beaker of water over a 16 minute period. The final method for displaying data that I'm going to demonstrate in this lesson is the two-way table or cross table. The table shows frequencies for two different attributes of the same people. In this case, whether they smoke or not and the number of colds that they had in the previous year. Each column and each row also has a total. So we'll start by filling in the missing parts of the table. We look at the non-smokers row. We have a total of 27 and we've got one missing number here. So we need to subtract the 4, 8, 4 and 1 from the 27, which leaves 10 non-smokers who each had one cold last year. And we can check with the column because 3 plus 10 is 13. That's the number of people who had one cold last year. We can also check the total of the totals for the numbers of colds. 4, 13, 10 and 3 adds up to 30, but this row needs to sum to 43, so this missing number here is 13. And then we can check the column, 13 minus 8 is 5. And then the number of smokers, 3 plus 5 plus 6 plus 2, is 16 and then one final check 16 plus 27 is also 43. Part B is asking did smokers or non-smokers have more colds? This is actually quite difficult to answer because it's open to interpretation but let's have a look at the total number of colds that smokers had last year. 
three smokers had one cold, five smokers had two colds each, so that's another ten colds, six smokers had three colds each, and two smokers had four colds each. So the total number of colds that smokers had was 39. Using the same method for the non-smokers, non-smokers had 42 colds altogether. But then we need to take into account the fact that in our survey there are more non-smokers than smokers. So let's instead refine our question. Part C is asking for the percentage of smokers and non-smokers who had more than two colds. Well, for the smokers, there were 16 of them, and how many of those 16 had more than two colds? 6 plus 2 is 8, so that's 50% of the smokers had more than two colds last year. For the non-smokers, there are 27 of them, and 5 of those 27 had more than two colds last year, which is close to 19%. The final question is asking, does smoking appear to affect health? And our previous result does suggest that there is a relationship between smoking and having more than two colds in a year. But we need to be very careful about suggesting that it's the smoking that affects the health. It could be that people who smoke also have a poor diet or live in a poor area. There are any number of factors it could be. We cannot say that smoking causes people to have more than two colds, but we can say that there appears to be a relationship between smoking and the number of colds people have.